result of the invitation of the Lord and the response of people hearing that invitation. Secondly, it's represented like as a great feast, a great banquet. So we're going to talk about that this morning, and we're going to bring an application to it uh, for our day and age. But as we get going this morning, I want us to begin with a statement. So I'm going to say it, and I'd like you to repeat after me, okay? Jesus wants his house to be full. Jesus wants his house to be full. Let's try that again. Jesus wants his house to be full. Here's the second part of the statement. And he wants to use me in that process. And he wants to use me in that process. It's indisputable, as we're going to study this morning, that he wants his house to be full. It's equally as indisputable, if you read the entirety of the the New Testament, that he wants to use his people to be the inviters, the bringers, and the includers. So we're going to talk about it in those terms this morning. Um, I'd like to read from Luke chapter 14, which is on the top of your notes. But before you really read what's on here, which is the direct target of where we're going this morning, I'd like to read uh, beginning at verse 12, because it sets the background, it sets the context Or the statements that Jesus is going to make. All right? Jesus talks, beginning at verse 7, about if you're invited somewhere, don't take the chief seats. Take the lowly places. Let the Lord be the one who honors you. Don't honor yourself. If you honor yourself, you've had the extent of your reward. So he talks about serving in the secret place. He talks about doing things that people wouldn't necessarily see you doing. He talks about having that kind of heart. That's really what's captured in there. Now, if you go to verse 12, because you see what he, what he finishes with in verse 11, whoever exalts himself will only find him or herself being humbled. But whoever humbles themselves, the Lord will exalt. That means to lift up, to showcase, to feature. So let's begin at verse 12. Then he also said to him who invited him, because Jesus had gotten invited, to a dinner. He said to this guy, when you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor your rich neighbors to to your uh, dinner, lest they also invite you back, and thus you get repaid. What's his point? Well, 13 and 14 tell us his point. But when you give a feast, Invite the poor, the maimed, that means the crippled, the lame, the blind. And when you do that, for the right reason, you will be blessed. Why? Because they cannot repay you. For you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Now, you see, he's taking something that's outward. There's a big dinner going on. People are invited. There's real people there. He's taking what's outward. And he's internalizing things for people there, both the inviters and the people having been invited. He's trying to bring an internal self-examination process into being so that people understand their own motives. Understand that these Pharisees and other people that invited Jesus were inviting him because at this point he was gaining lots of notoriety. So they said, hey, If he's going with the commoners and he's doing miracles and all that stuff, hey, let's call the press corps. Let's invite them to our place. Why should they get all, you know, the press for having this guy Jesus there? So they invite him there, and much to their dismay, Jesus was blowing up their motives for having done that by saying, listen, I'm glad you invited me. I mean, I'll have your dinner, but understand you're not going to get anything for this. Someone who really wants to serve me has to serve me from the heart. So if you really want my blessing and my father's blessing, how about inviting people who have no earthly means to repay you? Then your motives are really checked. 
See, he's getting to the heart. Jesus always got to the heart of the matter. So he kind of sets this table of context uh, by saying in verse 14, if you do things for the right reason, you'll be blessed. But when will you be blessed? Obviously, you'd be blessed in this life. But he said you'll be blessed at the resurrection of the just. Now, if you begin at verse 15, which is the beginning of your notes there. Uh, actually, hold on a second. No, that begins at verse 16. Verse 15, let's read together. Now, this, Jesus is laying these thoughts out. And he's saying, whoa, this Jesus is powerful. There's going to be a blessing coming back. I want to be part of that. Man, I'm at this dinner hearing this guy say this. So he blurts out, blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. This guy was assuming that what was going on there, that he was already in the kingdom, or subsequent to that, he'd certainly be invited to the great mystical banquet. He assumed that both himself and everyone present would also be at that final banquet. Now, how many of you know he was wrong? This Jesus blows this up in a moment. So now we can read at the top of your outlines together. So you see there's a backdrop here where people are like, huh? Whoa, wait a minute. They got a lot more than they bargained for coming for a free dinner. So Jesus said, let me put it to you this way, guys. He completely ignored this guy's comment as far as directly refuting it. Instead, he launches into a parable <clears throat> that refutes it. He says there's a certain man who gave a great supper and he invited many people, i.e., much like you guys today, is what he's saying. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. But they all began to make excuses. The first said to him, I've bought a piece of ground, and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. And another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to test them. I ask that you would excuse me. And the third guy said, I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. What he's saying is, Let, Master... I've invited everyone you told me to invite. They're all full of excuses. Then the master of the house being tolerant and understanding and compassionate. All the big buzzwords of our age. Does God help you if you're not? You'll be roasted on a spit. Because if you disagree, you're a hater. Hello? If you disagree from a conservative standpoint, you're instantly a hater. Well, I don't agree with that lifestyle. You see, hater, no, stop the hate. Stop the hate. No, I just don't agree with your lifestyle. Stop the hate. No, stop the picketing. Get a life. You say free speech as long as it agrees with you. Don't put up with that. I said don't put up with that. This political correctness is nothing but a fear, a tool of fear to keep people in a corner, afraid to say anything, lest they'll have to repent to the whole world. Did I say it right? Oh, my God. You're going to need therapy now because I said I disagree. <laughs> Get out of here. So the master of the house is angry. He's angry at the excuses. He's angry at the silliness. He's angry at the misplaced priorities. And he says to his servant, go out quickly into the streets. Notice the word quickly. That means I'm not giving it a second chance. I am not waiting one second longer for them to rethink it. Once the seats are filled, the bus is going. Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor, the maimed, and the lame, and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and yet, there, and yet still there is room. Still there is room. How many are Christians this morning? You know you're born again. 
Thank God you're in the kingdom of God. And guess what? There's still room. There's still room. And the master will not sleep. He will not rest. He will not relent until his house is full. So let's see what his heart is here. Now the master, his servant comes back and said, we've gotten everyone we know. We've gone, we've drug in people the cat wouldn't bring in. There's still room. And the master said to the servant, because this is the heart of the matter here. The master said to the servant, now go in, into the highways and the hedges and compel them. That means to literally to buttonhole them. It literally means to grab someone around the neck and bring them in. Does that seem like mealy mouth, wimpy evangelism to you? You better rethink it. Compel them to come in. Here's his heart. Ready? That my house may be filled. That my house, not partly filled, that my house may be filled. That word means to burst over, overflowing. So therefore, we started with that statement this morning. Jesus wants his house to be full. And he wants to use you and I to be part of his process of doing it. Okay, so now we have this great feast that Jesus is talking about. So let's kind of take the feast, this invitation, and let's take apart the dynamics of it for a second here. Let's go to Roman numeral two. The three components of this parable. Number one is what I call the great invitation. There's always a great invitation and the invitation is to all who would come, to all who would believe. And the invitation is still out there today. It's still binding. It's still drawing. There's always a great invitation. So when you're ministering to people, you got to put it in, this, in these terms, that the Lord is inviting people to his great banquet feast. Not that, you know, he's angry with them. If, if the Lord was ultimately angry with people, tell you what, he's angry with sin, but he's the only one who can separate the sin from the sinner. So he hates the sin, but he still loves the sinner because of what his son has done. Because if it weren't, you know, Jesus said, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. If he was angry with the sinner, how could he be angry with them and calling him at the same time? No, he's angry with the sin. He hates the sin, but he loves the sinner enough to continue to invite him. Remember who Jesus was talking to. It was the Pharisees who thought they were all righteous. They were all squared away with God. They, they said, what are you doing inviting prostitutes and tax collectors and sinners? And he said, hey, it's not those who are well that need a doctor. It's those who are ill. And in like manner, I've not come to call the righteous. Of course, that's tongue in cheek because what he was telling them is, uh, guys, I'm telling you, you're not righteous. You are not in right standing with my father. You think you are. Well, you're just a religious knucklehead. I did not come to call the righteous. I've called sinners. Not just sinners, though, sinners to repentance. There's a necessity of repentance. There's a necessity of answering the invitation on the, on the inviter's terms. Hello? If you get invited to someone's home for dinner, and you ask them, for example, can I bring anything? And they say, yeah, why don't you bring two dozen rolls for dinner? and you show up with an apple pie instead. I mean, I'll eat the pie, but you're supposed to bring rolls. You understand? So you're responding, but you've got to respond on the inviter's terms. So when you're ministering to people, don't cheapen the gospel by saying, just, man, don't you want to be spared from hell? Just pray this prayer with me and you're all set. No, you're lying to them. Because if it's not coming from their heart, 
if they don't realize that they're a sinner in need of a Savior, if that revelation hasn't dawned on them and come into their heart, you're wasting words. And nine times out of ten, you'll find that that person will not follow the Lord. Then you try a second time to share the gospel with them. They say, I've already done it. I'm all set. Or even worse, they'll say, I've, done, I've tried that and it doesn't work. Oh, it works. You don't work. The gospel works. God's word works. The question is, do you work? So the invitation goes out, but the inviter gives the time, the place, and the details. It's got to be responded to on his turn. But he said, all things are now ready. Let's go to a second component. After the great invitation, <clears throat> when people's hearts now are challenged, usually there comes the great excuses. And you see on your notes, I've just tried to kind of categorize what those are. You see in verse uh, 18 there, right under point two, it says, but they all with one accord. Isn't that amazing? All three of them did the same thing. They began to make excuses. <clears throat> Notice that Jesus doesn't say they gave their reasons. He calls them excuses, just flat out excuses. So he's, the first guy said, I bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. Now what's interesting is that no wise Jewish person of the day would ever buy a piece of ground without already having seen it. So maybe this guy's just lying through his teeth. Or he's just stupid. Either way, he makes an excuse that disqualifies him. Third guy says, I bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to go test them. I'm going to go prove them. I'm going to go kind of break them in the field. I ask that you have me excused. Third guy says, I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Now, what's interesting well, let's read uh, letters A, B, and C that describe the three excuses. It's just the general content. The first guy, when he talks about a piece of land, this is just about stuff. People get waylaid. They get distracted by the stuff of this life. Don't they? Stuff. Some people, I'm telling you, at least 100 over the course of our ministry, they pray and pray and pray. We stand with them. We stand with them because they need a good job. God gives them a job. You never see them in church anymore. Why? They're too busy with their job. And then when they get the day off from their job, they're too tired to come to church because of God's blessing. Yeah, that makes sense. Now they'll be accountable in double measure. They've just upped their, they've upped their accountability. By 100%. He said, I bought a piece of ground. Too many people get too busy with their things, with their possessions. The material things of this life can really wreak havoc and cause damage uh, on people. Let's go to letter B. The second guy says, I bought five yoke of oxen. Well, this is really symbolic of the work of our life. He bought five yoke of oxen because he's a farmer. So that really talks about occupation. Our occupation, people can be too busy with work. They can be too busy with things, and they can be too busy with work. I'm not saying we don't have to work. We have to, we have to work. We have to do the right thing. But at some point, you need to be diligent about keeping balance in your life. If you're the devil, why wouldn't you want a Christian to work so many hours they're of no spiritual good anymore? Why wouldn't you want to distract them with something that looks wonderful? He's not talking about going to a crack house. He's talking about going to work. And I'll tell you what, in most cases... The people that are going to work all those hours, they're so misprioritized that on top of everything else, they're not even giving from the money they're making. Why would you think they would? They're so out of whack. Why would you think they'd incorporate God into their first giving? 
You know what they'll do? In the rare event that they do make it to church, that's when they'll give. So in other words, instead of obeying scripturally, it's an admission fee to church. I don't come, I don't have to pay. What a deal. No, that's your deal, not God's deal. You're deceived. You've rewritten the scriptures to fit your excuses. You can really tell someone's maturity if they continue to give even when they're physically not here that day. Woo, that's hot. Man, I don't even want to touch that. Because if you don't, guys, you've been deceived into making giving an admission fee to church. You realize that in the Old Testament, anyone that missed tithing even once, they had to tack on 20% for a penalty fee. How would you like to rack that bill up with the Lord? You reach a certain point and he pulls back all of his blessings. You're the one who gets the pink slip the next day. Your business starts to shrivel. Your accounts start to shrivel. Your clients start to shrivel up. Doors start to close for you. It's not fulfilling for you anymore. All kinds of ways that the Lord can just take the faucet and go ever so slowly. Got to get this right, guys. See, you could be making excuses without even knowing it. That's my job to point it out. So, well, I didn't come that week. So, did you give? Because it's a, it's a God issue. He said, you give to me, which is to mean take care of the efforts of my kingdom. Put my kingdom and my agenda first, and I'll make sure I take care of you. He didn't say, and so if you show up, do that. That's why the best thing you could do for you, for you, is get on automatic giving. Get our app, go on automatic giving. It will keep you honest and keep you in right favor with God. You understand that just in layman's terms, one of the reasons that the Lord told the children of Israel that he set up the issues of tithing and first fruits and giving was to keep them from living selfish lives with the blessing. He said, I made a covenant with Abraham. It's going to flow down to you guys. Therefore, anyone who's going to be under the umbrella of that I'm going to keep you from you. I'm going to save you from you by requiring in the very law that blesses you that you give from it. First fruits, not last fruits, first fruits. The last fruits are the ones that rot. First fruits are your best one. The first lamb, the first sheep, the first of the vineyard, the first of the crops. The Lord says, if I'm good enough to get you heaven, why you give me the rotten stuff at the bottom of the barrel, that day old bagels I'm not real to you I'm not real to you because if it's real it changes your behavior it changes your heart changes your practices it changes your mentality or it's not real enough you got to beg God for it. You've got to beg God for it. Some of you have been in the kingdom of God long enough to know better, and you're still messing with this stuff. You're still messing with it. Shame on you. I'm not talking about someone who's been saved for six months. We're talking about you. You want God to work in your children's hearts that may not be serving the Lord? Do you want him to keep his hand on them? Do you want him to do stuff for you with people that are near and dear to you? Then what are you messing with? He sees that stuff. It's not about me. I couldn't care less. I don't even look. This is about you. This is about him with whom we have to do, uh, concerning whom all things are naked and laid bare before his eyes. Oh, man, oh, man. Don't go tell an unbeliever about the fear of the Lord if you're not even walking in it. Because judgment begins in the house of the Lord. I said, Peter said, judgment begins in the house of the Lord. And he said, and if we scarcely be saved, what will happen? What will become of the sinner? 
a fearful day of judgment. Get this stuff together. You read it in Luke 16. Jesus said, if you can't even be honest and diligent with regard to the mammon, that means just natural money, if you can't even do that, where are you going to go in the kingdom? What do you expect him to trust you with if the natural thing you can't even do the right thing with? What do you want, a prophet to tell you God wants to do this, he wants to do that? Listen, prophetic words are just snapshots of God's desire, not God's guarantees. And they are predicated upon our obedience to God's written, unchanging word. Even if a prophet doesn't specifically deal with that, we are already bound to this thing. It's called the Bible. Whew, and I'm glad a prophet didn't, didn't tell me all the ways I'm out of whack. He doesn't have to. You're out of whack. God opens his or her eyes to see your potential and God's desires in reference to that. And he gives you a bunch of snapshots so that we, he wants to entice us to get it together so we can lay hold of that. But it's not a guarantee. It's a, an invitation. So don't be full of excuses. Excuses. All right. So then let her see. The third guy gets invited, and he says, I've married a wife. And I've just kind of described it this way. In so many cases, people prioritize family over God. Well, my family always does this. Well, if they do it on a Sunday morning, so what? When you come to Christ, that ends for you. Tell your family, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be there at 11 o'clock. Yeah, but we always meet at 9.30 for coffee. Great. Pour me an extra cup. I'll meet you at 11 o'clock. Keep it warm for me. Keep my seat warm. I'll be there at 11 o'clock. Because as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. You would not believe the times that believers cave in to family traditions not once, I'm not talking about it, Christmas, all year long, because they get soulish with that stuff instead of spiritually minded. <clears throat> Social relationships, <clears throat> family, natural things, all this kind of stuff. You know, Jesus said, Who, whoever comes to me and doesn't love me even more than father, mother, husband, wife, children, dogs, cats, or anything else is not worthy to be called my disciple. You talk about politically incorrect, but Jesus didn't care. It's intolerant. That's right. King doesn't tolerate nonsense. It's not democracy. It's a kingdom. The king calls the shots. Tough. Get over it. Don't drag an American mentality into the kingdom. It's not going to fly. You know, it's interesting, too. This guy gives an excuse about, I've just married a wife. You know what I love about this is that even though in ancient Israel, if a guy married a wife, he'd be exempted for one full year from military duty. The first year of his marriage, he'd be exempted. And even though this guy said, I married a wife, Jesus doesn't give him an out. Jesus, oh, you married a wife? Oh, I understand. Go ahead and be with your wife. No, there's no such recognition by Jesus of that as an excuse or an exemption from kingdom commitment. You know what he's really saying? Good for you. I'm so happy for you. You liking it? Yep. You having a good time? Great, great. Now bring your wife and serve me together. Be a leader worth calling a leader. Amen. Let your leadership lead your family into righteousness, not soulishness. Or you're not a leader, you're pathetic. Amen. <clears throat> 
Guys, you want to be known as the head of your relationship, your family, your owner, then act like it. Yeah. Merit the respect. Earn it by leading your wife, girlfriend, fiance into righteousness. Okay, so we have the great invitation. We have the great excuses. Let's go to number three. After all that passes by, we're still left with the Great Commission. Right? Jesus is telling this story. He said, okay, after we got all excuses out of the way, okay, you're out, you're out, and you're out. Now, let's get back to what my heart is in the first place. My house is going to be filled. It's just a question of with whom. You had your shot. Now you're out. You, gone. You, history. But most seats will be filled. And you've blown it. So you see the whole point here, the scripture under the third point. He goes, go into the streets, the lanes of the city, go into the highways, go into the byways. <clears throat> so who are really invited? If you look at the New Testament, in Matthew 9, 13, sinners are invited. I'll just give these to you real quick. Sinners are invited. Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30, the weary are invited. If you're weary and loaded down with cares and hurts. Matthew 9, 13, sinners are invited. Matthew 11, 28 to 30, the weary are invited. And Matthew 5, 3, those poor in spirit are invited. Those who recognize they are spiritually impoverished without the Lord's presence. And they recognize their need to make a spiritual connection with him. Compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Now look at these two quotes at the bottom of your <clears throat> outlines. Kent Hughes says, on the most elementary level, and of course that's important to the, to the quote, elementary level, basic. You do not have to go to church to be a Christian. You do not have to go home to be married either. But in both cases, if you don't, you're going to have a very poor relationship. Yeah, just try to be married and not go home very often. You'll get your walking papers soon. And then D.L. Moody says, Church attendance is as vital to a disciple as a transfusion of rich, healthy blood is to a sick man. Okay, so now I want to address, in light of what we just covered, what kind of church we are and what kind of church we should strive to always be. Does that make sense to you? What kind of church victory is and what kind of church we should never lose sight of and always strive to be? What do we try to do each and every week? And I pray that we do this. First, every week in all that we do, we try and, ready for this, guys? Roman numeral three, we try and engage people emotionally. What does this mean? You see what I put in parentheses? Through love, warmth, and it providing a sense of family. Now, where is love demonstrated? Through our wonderful parking lot crew. Right? John Beauregard and whoever else was out there this morning. When people get help on a rainy, nasty day, when people are seeing our parking lot people smiling and saying, right over here, come over here, with a smile. <laughs> and as they pass by them, they get a last smile. <laughs> Love is being conveyed without one word ever passing between the two parties. Other than that, or you look like a bouncer with a flashlight in your hand. <laughs> oh, you again? Yeah, find a spot and get lost. <laughs> Give me a break. I'm telling you, I've been to some churches where I've been the guest preacher, and I walk in, I'm thinking, this guy's the head usher? Oh, my God. This dude's baptized in prune juice. He's really on a power trip. He likes to command his team 
like a drill instructor. Well, there's a time and a place for that. But in front of the church and in front of guests coming in is not the time and place. You need to get over yourself. Don't try and get an identity like that in church. Get an identity from Christ and let it work in the real world, then bring it in the church. That's why we really will not give a high place of authority to someone who's riddled with insecurities here. Because someone who has insecurities and gets a title will usually abuse people with it. Engage people emotionally. That's why we have our coffee bar. We want people to come in and relax. We want people to get to meet you who've been here for a while, if you've been here for a while. And prayerfully, we're assuming that you're going to love on them. We're going to assume that you'll even say hello to them. I know what happens when you assume, but you're worth it. (laughs) And provide a sense of family. There are some people, especially at this time of the year, their family situation is a nightmare. They're dreading going to a family gathering. In some cases, their family is so dysfunctional that the only real sense of family they get is here. Will we provide it for them? Say, well, well, I'd like to think so. Well, you can be sure of it because it starts with you. Don't assume someone else is going to do it. So when the Holy Spirit's looking at you, it starts with awareness. It starts with having the heart of Christ, first of all. But then it's got to, it made, <clears throat> excuse me, it's made functional through awareness. In other words, if I'm talking to two or three people that I know, at some point I've got to say, excuse me, I've got to be aware of new folks that are coming in, and I'm going to break out of this common conversation, and I'm going to go and just be a blessing and greet people and tell them we're so glad they're here. Other than that, we get into our little bless me club. And we dare people to try and break into it. You coming up close, don't even think about getting into this conversation. (laughs) Ever see little kids with toys? I see my toddlers doing it. One of them has a toy, the other one comes looking for it. Go away. Yeah. Or if you're in this conversation and you see someone you don't know, even if the other three people you're talking to, it doesn't click in quick with them, you say, hey, excuse me for a second. Hi, my name is, what's your name? I'm so glad to have you here. Hey, come on over. I want a couple people to introduce you to. What's that cost you? What does that cost you? Nothing. You can make all the difference in the world in that person's life. You have no idea what they've been contemplating. You have no idea what they've been going through. So we want to engage people emotionally. Because before we can engage them spiritually, it starts with the emotional part of who, who people are. Second, we're always trying to involve people physically. That's why we have so many areas of ministries of help, so many ministries and teams that you can get involved with. We want to provide servanthood opportunities for you. Because Jesus said, he whoever wants to be great in my kingdom has to be the servant of all. So we want to provide models for involvement because nothing changes your life and makes you think differently than when you, more than when you become part of a team. Now all of a sudden you start to know people on your team and you start to develop, make friends and develop relationships. So we have servanthood opportunities and activities and Bible studies and all kinds of other stuff. We want to involve involve people. And last, we want to challenge and equip people spiritually. How? Through the preaching of the word? That's why I don't just shout and spit and scream. That's why we go systematically through the Word. I try and bring an exposition to the Word, try and give a context, a background, and then an application so that you can take that with you and apply it this week instead of it going in one ear and out the other. So we try and 
challenged and equipped people with the word through the preaching, through Celebrate Recovery, through other small groups, Bible studies, whatever. Everything is geared toward bringing people into an understanding and an application of the word, God's word. Because God's word is what sets us free. Jesus said, when you know the truth, in your heart of hearts, that truth, that truth that you know will make you free. Whoa. How many of you ever discovered that at least one instance, when you read the Bible, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit said, see, that was you. Did that ever happen to anybody? He said, see, that was you. See, that's why you got in trouble. You violated this. Now listen to this. You can violate it, not even know you're violating it, but still bear the same fruit. That's why in the Old Testament they had sacrifices for sins of ignorance. Presumptuous sin. People that violated God's word and didn't even know it was in there. When it's brought to their attention, they had to provide a sacrifice for it. Whoa. Let's go to Roman number four. A few minutes left. Now, I want you to remember the six things that church members should say to every guest. First, as I said in that fictitious conversation set up, thank you for being here. It's just that basic. <clears throat> I have, Debbie and I have heard from numerous church guests, they returned because they were simply told thank you. Thank you for being here. So great that you're here. Second, the second thing we should say is let me help you with that. If you see somebody struggling with umbrellas, young children, diaper bags, purses, other items, a gesture to hold something for them is a huge positive. Of course, this comment is appropriate for member-to-member -member relationships as well. Now, I'm going to put a huge asterisk over this whole thing. Understand with me that it has to be an appropriate time and setting for all of these things. So don't let that run through your mind. I'll do it for you by having said that. Third, please take my seat. Remember the old Henny Youngman thing, take my wife, please. Well, this is take my seat, please. If, if you see a family of five comes in and you're sitting there, again, awareness, awareness that when you're in the kingdom of God, you've been a member here for a while, it's not about you anymore. It's not about me anymore. It's about them. Okay, number four. Again, now this is a, a double asterisk. I understand that. Here's my contact info especially if you connect with somebody in a conversation. If you're a single guy and a single guy comes in and you engage in conversation the way you should and you find that you have some common interests or whatever, guess what? <clears throat> then there's nothing wrong with this. And number five, <clears throat> can I show you where you need to go? You might be saying, well, should I tell people where to go? No, not in that way. You ask someone, can I show you where you need to go? For example, I wrote here, guests will not necessarily know where to find the nursery, the restrooms, the Victory Kids sign-in desk, whatever. You can usually tell when a guest does not know where he or she is to go, so pay attention. You see how all of this is predicated upon awareness and then willingness? Be aware of these things. You want God to use you this is how he wants to start to use you. Forget about the ultimate will for your life. If you're not even doing the basics, what do you care? What does it matter? What does it matter what God's ultimate will is? That's not going to happen anyhow. Number six. This is a huge one here too. Let me introduce you to the return rate of guests is always higher if they get to meet other people quickly. A church member may have the opportunity to introduce the guest to one of the pastors, other church staff, other members of the church. We all need friends, so help to make this happen by engaging our guests in simple conversation, learning what interests them, 
their general age bracket, et cetera, and then help to make the connections for them. If you see that they're interested in this and that and their general age bracket, get to know people in your mind. Get to know what our ministries are, who heads them up. But listen, bring them over to introduce them to two or three people in their general age range that have the same general interest that you know. Make the connection for them. Take them over yourself. Don't just point across the sanctuary. And honestly, <clears throat> from up here, we, we never call someone just by their first name. When you call someone just by their first name, I'm saying, let's say for me, if I'm using Chris Luster, I'll say, uh, Chris Luster, would you stand up, please? I don't say, hey, Chris, would you stand up, please? Why? Because for the majority of you who don't know Chris, you know, it seems like mom, pa. We got a little setup here, and who cares if you don't know him? See, we're close, but we're not. No, put everyone on a level playing field. When you call someone by their first and last name, it makes it easier for that person to not feel like, oh, boy, everyone in this place knows each other on a first-name basis, but I don't know anybody. See, because that small church thinking has a time and a place, and that's on a public setting, that's not the time and place. And then last, <clears throat> would you join us for lunch? Again, this is when the setting is right and you feel it. I've saved this suggestion last for two reasons. First, the situation must obviously be appropriate. Second, I've seen this approach have the highest guest return rate out of any single factor. And Sabine and Adele tomorrow used to do this faithfully every single week. We would give them a list of people for them to get together with and use their gift of hospitality to get together with. It got to the point where we give them a list of 10 people. They already got together with eight, eight out of 10 without us having told them. Why? Because we trained them and their mentality, their heart came through and their mentality, when their heart plugged in with an awareness mentality, it all worked. And some of you have a gift of hospitality and you're not using it. All of us should have the gift of the warmth of Christ and we all should be using it. Boy, that got quiet right there. Do you realize I'm telling you the truth here? Don't be religious, be spiritual. As Christ-loving members of victory, imagine what could happen. Now look at the last couple sentences there. Imagine what could happen if each of us prayed and sought to invite different guests just six to 12 times a year. That means either one every two months, two months, just one person, or one person every 30 days. If you prayed for them, struck up a conversation and invited them to the house of the Lord with you, imagine the impact on the church. And I'll tell you what, the impact on you would be immeasurable. Your, your evangelism, your confidence, your spiritual quotient would never be the same again once you allow the Holy Spirit to use you like that. See, it's great to serve on ministries doing tasks, but when you reach a person one-on-one -on -one and you're instrumental in either leading them to Christ or weaving them into the fabric of the church, it will change your life. At a much higher level than vacuuming a floor will. And they're both necessary, but keep them in right priority. See, the burden would not be great, but the impact is huge. All right, let's move to our final little segment. Then what should we all do in reference to what we've covered today? Especially in this Christmas season, full court press. Number one, pray for the lost. Number two, be a friend. Is that too hard so far? I mean, is that too demanding? Third, tell people the good news of Jesus. That means, hey, look, all I'm going to tell you is, I never used to believe this stuff either. But my life was there, and now it's here. And I'm going to tell you firsthand, as a former skeptic, he's real. And what I thought was relationship was just a religious hangover. That's what I was lacking, 
And I'm sure, my friend, that's probably what you're lacking. Give him a try and watch to see what he'll do. See, in effect, that's telling people the good news of Jesus. And then as they can handle the theological components, you just weave them in in layman's terms. Jesus came to die for all of our sins. We all blow it. Ask them, have you ever made a mistake? Have you ever done a few things you wish you never had? Yeah. Guess what? The Bible calls that sin. And we all sin. Can you imagine dealing with a God that if you had one sin on your record, you'd never be able to connect with him again? Well, guess what? That's actually what went on there. And Jesus came to bridge the gap between God and man so that we could walk across his shoulders as evidenced on that cross. And we can be brought from a place of distance from God into a relationship with him. Doesn't that sound good to you? Yeah. That's what we were lacking in old whatever church. But that's what you could have today. See, that's the good news of Jesus. In layman's terms. Because people say, well, I don't know enough theology. Listen, that was woven with theology right there without hammering them with chapters and verses. Right? You got to catch a fish before you can eat them. I mean, you want a fish to jump up out of the lake, all cleaned up and ready to go? All right, suppose it's my time. Go for it. So you got to meet people where they're at today and watch the Holy Spirit change them. So pray for the lost. Be a friend. Tell people the good news of Christ. And then bring people to church with you and take care of them. That means if you bring them, if you have to, you pick them up. You sit with them. You introduce them to people. Don't take them here, drive up to the front door, take them by the, by the, butt, by the scruff of their neck and throw them in the door. <laughs> I've done my part. No, you haven't done anything. You've just been a big turnoff because they think you're a jerk. If it's good enough for them to come, why aren't you coming? You're a hypocrite. See, that's what used to happen to me. Got to the point where one of my parents would come, I'm going to drive you to church today, and drop me off in front of church, and I would go in, and then I thought after a little while, when I got a little bit older, wait a minute, if this is supposed to do some good, why aren't you coming? What, you've done your time? You've been paroled from this place now? And I started to think, what? Then I got smart. Well, smart, dumb, whatever you want to call it. I would go in the door. I would see what priest was doing the mass in case I went through the Inquisition. I'd take a bulletin just for phony evidence. Then I'd go hang out with my friends. And then come back to the front of the church for pickup time. Don't say I'm not smart. <laughs> but you see, all that was based upon, wait a minute. If it's good enough for you to bring me, why aren't you coming? This makes no sense at all. It's useless to you, but it's good for me? I don't think so. So look at the last two things on your notes. Jesus said... Don't you say in four months the harvest will be here? I'm telling you to look and see that the fields are ready for harvest now. And then Psalm 126, those who sow in tears today will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will doubtless return with songs of joy, carrying his sheaves of the harvest with him or her. Isn't that great? Come on, let's stand together. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for watching. We would love for you to do two things. First, click the logo and subscribe to our channel. And second, like, comment, and share our videos with those whom you care about. We're always updating our page with the latest messages and original content. Thanks for watching.